Todd Haley destroys Gase and the Jets over handling the handling of Le'Veon Bell. Jamison Crowder to miss Sunday. And once AFL brothers, the Jets and Chiefs couldn't contrast any more severely. Sable Radio, Jets two days away from playing week number eight in Arrowhead Stadium looking for their first victory. 0-7 against 6-1. Not going to be pretty, folks. But, hey, it's football. Anything could happen. And Le'Veon Bell, that angle of it makes things incredibly interesting. We first start with a Quinn and Williams story. Uh, rumored to be on the trade block, or at least rumored to be in the discussion for the Jets looking to trade the kid, Quinn and Williams uh, took some criticism from NFL network analyst Bucky Brooks. He said, quote, Williams has clearly been a major disappointment for the Jets. He's talented, but he hasn't been disruptive or productive. Remember, he was a one-year wonder at Bama, could take time for him to mature, or we simply missed on a flasher with traits and a brief resume. I mean, I don't know what you're talking about with we missed. Yeah, I, no one bashes any first round pick. No analyst in any network bashes a first round pick. It just it's the one of the rarest things you'll ever see. Everyone's great, and every pick is tremendous. Unless you're Chris Berman in the '80s and '90s as a Jet fan, losing his mind over the drafting of Roger Vick or Kyle Brady, uh, you know, what have you. But that prompted a lot of outrage from Jets fans, and sort of deservedly so, even though it wasn't terrible what Brooks said. He's, he's even taken blame upon himself that he missed on a flasher. But Williams hasn't been that bad. Uh, major disappointment rookie year, yes. Major disappointment this year, no. No chance. He's a 37th ranked interior defensive lineman in the league. And considering there's only 32 teams, he's nearly a number one defensive tackle on a team. You want to see that higher? But he's shown flashes. Three sacks, already a half more sack than last year. So, you know, everyone lost their minds, got on Brooks. And this includes his agent. Nicole Lynn, who said, quote, in their most respectful way, can I ask, have you actually watched him this year? I have a lot to respect. I have a lot of respect for what you do, Bucky, but this is the worst take I've seen in a really long time. Again, that's a, she's right, but that's an overreaction as well. It's, it's somewhere in the middle. Quinn has been better, but everyone wants to sensationalize and go nuts. Um, and Gase, speaking of Williams, earlier in the week, Gase said the Jets are not trading the kid. So take that for what it's worth as the Jets go into, go into Kansas City with Quinnen. Injury report. Gase already ruled out Blake Cashman, Bradley McDougald, Bashard Perryman. They all did not practice on Friday. Crowder and Sam Ficken have been downgraded to doubtful they will most likely not play either crowder did not practice friday he was a limited practice on thursday and to gase everything looked fine and ready to roll but once practice ended crowder told the correct people that he felt it in his hamstring still uh, excuse me groin he felt it in his groin still so he's going to miss his fourth game this year and he's played only four so the man's starting to develop sort of a injury history. Uh, you know, he healthy last year, but he missed some games in Washington. That tag is starting. It's not there yet, but it's starting to get to Crowder, Crowder's resume as a professional football player. Uh, without Perryman, suddenly Denzel Mims, the reemergence of Denzel Mims from hibernation becomes ultra critical. He is their only legitimate weapon now, and he's the number one and expect Sam Darnold to have Braxton Berrios and Jeff Smith along with Mims. 
this Sunday. Speaking of Bell, Todd Haley, his former offensive coordinator in Pittsburgh for all five seasons, I think Haley got there a year before Bell, 2012, and I think Bell arrived in 2013, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Yeah, that makes sense. Sat out 18, 19, and 20 with the Jets. Todd Haley pretty much slammed Adam Gase in the Jets for the handling of Bell, for how they handled Bell. He hopped on the Monday Morning Quarterback Podcast, the Albert Breer Show, and it the the words look harsher than how it sounded in the podcast. There's no question about that, so that needs to be said beforehand. But Haley did not pull his punches. I mean, he he went on, went in on the Jets on Gase on how they handled it. Quote, I was very frustrated for him in New York. I felt like that was a bad spot for him to go because he is a unique talent. When you have players with the special ability that they have, you got to make them feel and trust that you're giving them an opportunity to, to be the best they can be. So the frustration for me watching, watching him in New York is I'm cringing saying they're just lining this guy in the I formation and they're not utilizing. And I'm not trying to be overly critical but you're not using the ability that this kid has because he's not just a running back. I think Bell finished ranked fifth or sixth at the running back position in receptions last year, which is not the output that he had a couple of seasons at Pittsburgh, but it was not far off either. Gase did not utilize Bell to the best of Bell's ability. No question. But Bell in New York was a marriage that was never going to work, ever. You're not ready for prime time. You don't have an offensive line. You don't pay money. You don't dish out money to a 20... He's going to be 27 the first year. He's 28 now. Uh, He was 26 during free agency. You don't dish out that money to a 27-year-old running back. It's just that simple. Haley, quote, your best players, they better believe and trust that you're maximizing their abilities. In Kansas City, what I've seen from those coaches is that they do that. I mean, hell... Absolutely. Reed is tremendous. And the Chiefs offense is just a well-oiled machine. Quote, players can see through the fraudulent talk. You better be talking to them straight and you better back it up. End quote. So Haley semi-rips Gase and the Jets for their handling of Bell. Haley also discussed Antonio Brown and his work ethic. And it's important to note, Haley also said Bell, uh, some of his recent troubles are self-inflicted wounds you know such as holding out for an entire season and so on and you got to remember this is a guy bell and haley them two together they had a lot of success he's not going to throw bell under the bus it just won't happen he's going to defend them and at this point it's low-hanging fruit to to really hammer the jets and hammer adam gase And not that it's undeserving, but it's easy and it's low-hanging fruit. Uh, So not much of a surprise here. And there'll be more to come, too. Haley isn't the first, won't be the last. And there'll be more to come. And Bell, man, you could see him going off this Sunday. I'll tell you that. When you think of the Jets and the Chiefs, what I think about, at least, is... The AFL Brotherhood. These two teams resembled each other more closely than any two teams in NFL history. Maybe the Packers and the Bears, because their history is ridiculously long. But in terms of modern football history, Chiefs and Jets, they are AFL brothers. And if you think about it, you know, the Jets, Namath, they come in in 1968, do the impossible. 18-point underdogs, upset, shoeless Baltimore Colts, win a Super Bowl no one thought was possible, win a game everyone laughed at and thought it was a joke. The Super Bowl was a joke at that time, at that point. The AFL and their high-flying circus act, it wasn't football to the NFL. It was second rate. It was a clown show. What football league passes this much what football league tries to garner the attention to this level instead of playing old school 
grind it out style of ball. The AFL was a joke. And the Jets and Namath and what they did in 68 propelled the league to new heights. We don't know what would have happened to that league and to the Super Bowl if the Jets don't win that game. We just don't know. The Packers steamrolled the Chiefs and the Raiders the first two years. That Jet win was the start of what we see today in modern football. And that's why Namath, as overrated as he may be, I don't think his stats are. Because when you modernize his stats, they come out looking pretty solid, looking pretty impressive. But he's overrated because of his name. There's no question. And we'll get into that a little more when we talk about Trevor Lawrence to wrap up the show. The Jets did it. Then the very following year, the Chiefs did it, beating the Minnesota Vikings 23-7. to And that was the last year of the AFL. The merger happened after that, 1970. And it was the Jets and the Chiefs, the two AFL powerhouses at the time, the Raiders were right there too, who got it done who paved the way to modern football. And since that point, up until, I don't know, say 2012, 2013, the Jets and the Chiefs were bitter disappointments for four and a half decades. Fans always waited for the other shoe to drop. They waited for disaster. The, the two franchises really mirrored each other. They really, really did. As great as they were to create what we see in modern football today is as disappointing as they've been since then. Chiefs, I think, uh, yeah, one AFC championship appearance in all that time uh, before Andy Reid, and it happened in 1993 with Joe Montana. They only made the playoffs 16 times up until Andy Reid. Jets, 14 times up until the same point. And and today, obviously, because they haven't made the playoffs in the last decade. These two franchises were bitter disappointments. And then Andy Reid happened. And then the 2017 draft happened. McCagnan took Jamal Adams. Listen, Jamal Adams is a tremendous player, but he doesn't play the position Patrick Mahomes does. Four picks later, Patrick Mahomes goes to the Chiefs. And for it to be complete... The Chiefs needed to make a gutsy decision at quarterback. Alex Smith coming off another Pro Bowl appearance, three with the Chiefs, 26 touchdowns, five interceptions, was kicked to the curb in favor of Mahomes. Mahomes wins the MVP, goes nuts, throws 50 touchdowns. They get to the AFC Championship game, lose to Brady in a heartbreaker, D Ford with the offsides. And at that point, everything changed. The Jets had Darnold. They felt the future was bright. They fired balls, but they didn't fire McCagnan. They waited. They let McCagnan draft one, one more time. They hired Adam Gase. The Chiefs stuck with the program, won the Super Bowl. And these AFL brothers who did so much to create the league we see now and who were disappointing for so many decades they couldn't contrast any more greatly now. The Chiefs are at the top with the best coach quarterback duo in the land in Reed and Mahomes with Brady down in Tampa. And the Jets are just the worst team in the league with Darnold being a complete mess. It's, it's interesting to think about how close these two organizations are in terms of their history and their meaningful history and what they did for the sport and where they are now based on the last half decade. The Chiefs hired the right guy in Andy Reid in 2013. The Jets are still searching for that guy. And that's the biggest difference. In terms of this week, I mean, honestly, what, what's to analyze? Who could possibly break this game down? To think about and, you know, I do dig into Kansas City's offense a lot, but to think about what the Jets could do to stop Kansas City's offense is something no one should do unless you're coaching the Jets. It's just an impossibility. 
You're not going to stop this Chiefs offense. No game plan you come up with will do it. If I'm Greg Williams, I take the similar tact I did last week. Bend but don't break. Keep everything in front of me. Allow the yards. Don't allow the touchdowns. And if you're on offense, the Jets offense, pray. That's all. Because this Chiefs defense is really good. Spagnolo is the real deal. Uh, that's why I love the Chiefs to win the Super Bowl last year going into the playoffs. Spagnolo knows how to call championship defenses. Chris Jones is a game wrecker. They're just a really good defense. And offensively, uh, there's no strategy. There's nothing in mind. Again, for the Jets, it's still about their own team, their own issues in-house rather than the opponent. Even when the opponent is this scary. So what, final score... 124 to 3, maybe. 96 to 7. Somewhere around that range. Finally, we get a little get into a little Trevor Lawrence talk. The kid who came down with COVID earlier this week. Uh mandatory 10 days of isolation at the very least. Then he's got to get retested several times before he could rejoin the team and play. So he'll miss. Boston College this weekend. I think it's Boston College. But why Trevor Lawrence should accept the New York Jets quarterback challenge and the New York Jets quarterback challenge being that they have been challenged at the position since Namath. Everybody's coming out of the woodwork. Lawrence should avoid the Jets. Don't commit career suicide. It's ridiculous. First of all, how many power plays, true power plays, have been executed over the, the long history of the draft? Eli Manning in 2004, Elway in the early 80s. It doesn't happen that often. And at least it doesn't happen that often in today's game since the rookie wage scale. You know, in the old days, in the 80s, the 70s, teams would intentionally pass up players that they wanted to draft because they already knew they would be a pain in the ass to negotiate with and or they wouldn't sign with them because negotiations happened oftentimes through back channels before the selection was made. So the players really tried to maneuver their own fate. As the years progressed, it became less and less so that way. And then after Bradford, about a decade ago, they introduced the rookie wage scale, which means if players mess around, they risk falling in the draft which means they risk losing money automatically back in the old days it wasn't like that it was there was no set amount money so you could play around and you could dare teams to not draft you today it doesn't work that way in lawrence's case because he's such a big time prospect he will never slide out of the number one pick there's no question so if he refuses to play for the jets the jets will have to make a trade acquire assets, trade down, and let that team take him at one, or the Jets would select him like the Chargers did with Eli Manning and then trade him. Now, Eli, Archie, they didn't want to play for the Chargers. No one knows exactly why. There are theories. But my point is, my main point is this, it's not about the organization as much as it is about the people running the organization. Joe Douglas is the best weapon the Jets have. Eli, Tom Condon, who was Eli's agent, Archie, they didn't choose the Chargers, I think, and most people think, even the man himself, which you'll see here, because they didn't like the people running the Chargers. A.J. Smith was a relatively unknown GM. He was a scout. He rubbed people the wrong way. His Some of the stories with, with him are infamous. He spoke to SB Nation a couple of years ago, and even though he doesn't know for sure, he's pretty sure they didn't choose the Chargers. You know, they rejected the Chargers because of A.J. Smith. Quote, they wanted no part of San Diego because of me. I was a scout that was a novice GM and, quote, inside quote, 
He doesn't know what he's doing right now. He just got there. Head coach Marty Schottenheimer was there, and Tom Condon was his was Eli's agent. And my sources told me that he knew Schottenheimer wasn't long for the place, which was true. Condon certainly didn't like how Schottenheimer handled quarterbacks, also true. He certainly didn't like the way he handled Drew Brees. Obviously, Brees was in San Diego before Rivers took over. Him and Gates really paired up to be tremendous. I think it's 2003. He certainly didn't like that Schottenheimer benched him, and he just had a long list. LaDainia Tomlinson was there, a bona fide star that was going leaps and bounds in San Diego and the NFL. So Tom thought, I'm not going to place someone there. It's about the people, end quote. It's about the people. Condon, super agent. Who's Lawrence going to take pick as his agent? Joe Douglas is not A.J. Smith. Yes, he's a new GM. So novice GM, sure. But he is widely respected around the league. He paid his dues longer than a lot of other people. He learned from Ozzie Smith. This is a lot different than what the Chargers had. And the other crucial part is, I mean, unless something goes completely haywire, Lawrence will have a new coach. He'll have an offensive coach that he wants to play for and can't wait to play for. He'll have Douglas, who, and there's you know nine games left this season. He'll have Douglas, whose talent could keep improving from this point forward this season, and Lawrence will see that. So it's about the people running the organization, not the organization itself. And I think the Jets aren't in as bad a situation as everyone thinks. And, you know, this laughing stock narrative right now this season, 0-7 with what they've, the points they've put up and the all-time putrid play, you know, record-shattering play, it's deserving. But in terms of a franchise over the last two, three decades, you know, 25 years, 20 years since Parcells, they've been a middle-of-the-pack franchise. You know, from 98 to Rex in 2010, they made the playoffs seven times. Two AFC title games. The last decade has not been good. Only double digits once, 10 and 6, 2015, no playoffs. But the narrative that the narrative would lead some alien who gets dropped in on Earth to believe that the Jets are the worst team of in, in NFL history. And it's not close. But that's New York. That's the New York media. And I think Lawrence, if he's a smart kid, understands that. New York, and the other thing is this, New York, it's not like the old days where New York was huge and you had to have New York to be a bigger star. You know, technology, information has changed that. At the same time, why is Namath's name overrated? It's a brand name that's overrated. Even if you know his stats weren't overrated and his production weren't, wasn't overrated. And I believe that if you modernize the stats, like I said before, it's a very different picture, but why is his brand name overrated? Because of the guarantee and because he was society's first big pop culture athlete, him and Muhammad Ali in the sixties, the late sixties, those two guys, and because of New York, that propelled it into another stratosphere. For Lawrence, the same could be said. Not only because of New York, but because this Jets franchise needs a hero in the worst way. And if he turns around this downtrodden organization while doing it in New York, there could be and would be no bigger hero than Lawrence. There's no in-between. It's you're celebrated and you're overrated or you're beaten down to a pulp until there's nothing left. That's New York. And if Lawrence is that special, he won't look to avoid that idea. So, 1 o'clock this Sunday, Jets Chiefs, uh, Arrowhead Stadium, and Darnold, as per usual, will be shorthanded. 
Uh, expect Berrios, Smith, uh, Mims out wide. They still have their tight ends healthy, but they don't catch any passes. And then Gore and Perrine in the backfield. And the good news is along the offensive line, they look pretty good, look pretty healthy. Uh, I, I really want to see Cam Clark, but Alex Lewis is back. So unless Cam Clark sneaks in there over Van Rotten, that's not happening. Uh, one o'clock this Sunday, you know, just look for the player's development. I mean, that's pretty much all you could look for. The last memory I have, at least, I don't know if they've played in Arrowhead since then, was Ryan Fitzpatrick's, what was it, five interception game? Five or six interception game? It's highly overrated, that that performance as well. Because once he had those first two picks and they were down, he was just chucking balls up. You know, he even said it after the game. What's the difference? Two interceptions or six interceptions? If it doesn't uh, give us a chance to cut into this lead and try to win, there's no difference between two and six. It, it's a selfless act, really. Uh, it's a selfless team act rather than worrying about his personal stats. Uh, but one o'clock this Sunday, Jets Chiefs. We'll talk to you after that. Check out iTunes. Do me a favor. Check out iTunes. Uh, follow, rate, and review the podcast at iTunes. We we do pretty well on Spotify and other platforms, but iTunes, we really got to push a little harder. And until next time, we'll talk to you after the soon-to-be massacre at Arrowhead Stadium. <laughs>